Dear God, we're grateful for the day that you have blessed us with. Thankful that you have given us this opportunity to come here this morning and magnify and glorify your name. Help us that as we dive into the text this morning that we consider not our own hearts or our own intentions, but consider your will for us and see how we can be molded and see how we can be shaped to be perfect reflections of you in all that we do. Dear Lord, we're grateful uh, for the good health that you have given us this morning and we're mindful that there are others who are striving for the same thing at this time. Help them to have speedy recoveries. Help them to be strengthened and encouraged and help us to meet those needs uh, physically that they may have as they arise. Dear Lord, we're grateful that you have blessed us to be in a nation where we can come to worship you without fear of persecution and that we can do so um, in, in a way that brings glory and honor um, uh, to, to you in a way that helps us to shine your light to others. Dear Lord, as we enter into this day of worship, let us lay aside the sorrows and the burdens of this world. Let us lay aside the things that might separate us from you and allow for us to be fully dedicated and committed to our exaltation of your name this morning. Dear Lord, we're grateful that you have blessed us with this day and we hope that we use it for its true intention, for its true purpose, to give glory and honor to your kingdom. We're grateful most of all for the sacrifice that your son gave upon that cross. It allows for us to have a home in heaven with you. It allows for our prayers like this to be heard. Dear Lord, we're grateful for that sacrifice. And it's through your son's most holy name that we pray. Amen. All right. Acts chapter 12. Uh, we're going to get into a, a little bit of a, of a section of Scripture. Uh, we get a little bit of something interesting happening in verses 5 and following, but we're going we're to get into that section of Acts where we get a lot more of the descriptions of um, just the generalized actions. It's going to be a lot of traveling, a lot of um, uh, going to and fro, and uh, listing of names, and you'll have some... Um, important or, or essential messages being taught, but a lot of this you have to remember is a recording of the Acts of the Apostles, what the Apostles were doing within their work, how they were magnifying and glorifying the name of God as they continued to go throughout the world. And what we're going to see now is we're going to see a little bit of, of, of some backlash, if you will, of some of the things um, concerning this teaching. We're going to see uh, the violence towards the church, especially on behalf of Herod, and the um, personal attention that he gives to the persecution of the first century church and some of its main uh, teachers and some of its main influencers. So let's begin in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 4 and kind of take a pause uh, and look back at those, that section for just a second. Now about the time that Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the some, excuse me some from the church, then he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of the unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four squads of soldiers to keep him, um, intending to bring him before the people after. Passover. So, uh, like I mentioned, uh, we're going to see a little bit of this persecution. You'll notice that Herod uh, is seeking to, uh, my translation at least translates the word as harass the people, cause conflict, cause division, cause pain and suffering upon the followers of the way. And included within this harassment or included within this persecution of followers of the way, includes the death of James, the brother of John, uh, with the sword. Now you'll notice as well that this is not um, where Herod sought to end. He, he, he wanted to continue with this persecution, and he set his eyes upon Peter. You'll notice verse 3, a little bit of the um, inclination as to why Herod might be continuing on with this, um, with this persecution. The beginning of verse 3 tells us that he saw that this action of the killing of James, the brother of, of uh, John. Uh, if I say James, the brother of Jesus, just know I'm, I mean James, the brother of John. <laughs> but sometimes I'm, my brain just won't say it right. Uh, James, the brother of John, he saw that the, the killing of him uh, with the sword pleased the uh, Jews. That it, it brought them joy. And so he wanted to continue on with this. And what better person to set his eyes on than that of Peter? 
Now, if you'll remember back to the following chapters in which we've examined the um, works of Peter, you'll notice that Peter is probably one of the hardest working, one of the most diligent, and one of the most famous of the followers of Jesus. He was present upon the day of Pentecost, and, and in fact, he is the one at least um, that we can see uh, from our translations in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, the one to deliver the message of the gospel first unto the Jews, and then uh, several chapters later, prison Peter would have been something that could have had a very diligent or a very powerful effect upon the followers of the way. If you um, were to have learned that the one who sought to teach you the gospel or helped to teach you the gospel, the one who is continuing in their efforts diligently to go and spread the message of Jesus, if you were to learn that that person was in prison and, and, and to be put to death, that would have an impact upon you. It would hopefully, um, in the eyes of the persecutor, that would seek to uh, sway you to no longer be a follower of the way. And so that was his goal, was that maybe if I can get this Peter, maybe if I can uh, imprison him, put him to death the same, the same way that he put James to death, maybe this will help to uh, go against these followers of the way, which would, of course, be pleasing in the eyes of the Jewish people. Why would it be important for Herod to care about how the Jewish people felt? What would be beneficial for Herod to have the Jewish people be upon his side? Keep the peace. There's the sheer number of the people. Uh, to, keep, to keep peace amongst them would be to, to help t to uh, keep them within his reign. He's do, he's some, he does something very evil and wicked. Uh, but in the eyes of those Jewish people or those Jewish individuals, he's doing something that is glorifying God. He's continuing to work by killing these blasphemers or by killing these followers of this, this Jesus and so in doing so, he would keep the peace because he is, he is doing something that directly affects those who seemingly oppose the Jewish people or seemingly oppose the Jewish faith because of their teaching of the new way or the teaching of the true way. And so in order to continue to have this control, in order to get them on their side, you would see as Herod would continue on this. And what better person to encourage the Jewish people to be on his side even more than Peter? the one who is probably doing the most damage to the Jewish belief system, if you will, um, and therefore the, the most betterment of the world, if you will, of, uh, as far as his work is concerned. So notice what happens in verse 4. They arrest him, they put in him to prison, and they delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him um, before the people after Passover. Okay, a few things um, to note here. Notice the time uh, that all of this is occurring. The second half of verse 3. Now it was during the days of what? The, the days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And notice that he is placed in, the, in prison awaiting um, for his trial, if you will, or, or awaiting um, to bring him before trial until after what? Until after Passover. Any of this sounding a little familiar, maybe? What about, uh, what about also notice in the first half of verse 4, they delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him. Um, uh, what, we see, what we can see from that at least is they did not intend for Peter to ever get out, uh, to, have, to, to have four groups of soldiers to be appointed to the keeping of Peter within this prison. The intention of Herod was to not let this Peter um, out of prison. Uh, once again, his goal is to uh, encourage the Jews by killing those who are followers of this way uh, through persecution of the church. He is in prison this Peter, the one who opened up the gospel to the Jews and to the Gentiles alike, and now has assigned these multitudes of soldiers to make sure that this Peter never gets out. Many questions concerning verses 1 through 4 or comments. I believe so. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> I think that has to do a little bit of uh, concern the miraculous aspect of things. Yes, sir. I was four at a time. Um, when we look, um, I was reading something the other day, and it was this individual was talking about uh, the trials that we face in life. 
And uh, he, he said, you'll notice uh, if, uh, that we see things like um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being saved from the fiery furnace. We see as Daniel is saved from the lion's den. We see as Peter is rescued from prison, and even Paul at times is rescued from prison. But you'll notice in all of these instances, they weren't rescued by never entering into these situations. They were rescued out of these situations. So oftentimes, don't, you know, don't feel neglected, don't feel turned down if you are in a moment of sorrow or pain or suffering or in a moment of persecution or rejection. Uh, just know that maybe it's your turn in the fire. And uh, in those moments is only when you can be delivered. Um, let's, look at how, uh, let's look at how this plays out with Peter's imprisonment. Verse 5 says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, uh, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, the night uh, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the, uh, before the door uh, were keeping the prison. Uh, now behold, the angel of the Lord stood by him, and light shined on the prison, in on the prison, and he struck Peter and the, uh, on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird yourself and tie your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know uh, that what was done by the angel was real, but thought that he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them in, of its own accord. And they went out and went down on, on one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel. He has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the excuse me, expectation of the Jewish people. And so when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, and they were, where, they were, where many were gathered praying together. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came, and answer, uh, came to answer. Uh, when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, You are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, It is his angel. Uh, now Peter continued knocking, and when, they went, uh, and when they opened the door, they saw him. They were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir uh, uh, among, the, excuse me, among the soldiers about what had, had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and did not find him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea, and he stayed there. Okay, there's a lot that happens in these verses. Um, there's a lot of individual things. So we're going to try and go by verse by verse without reading through everything uh, too in-depth again. Uh, but notice that as Peter is in prison, verse 5, that there is one intention of the hearts of the people of the church. They're continuing to pray that, that Peter be delivered that Peter be um, brought out of this uh, persecution. And notice that the same night, uh, or the night before, that Herod was to bring him before the council, bring him before the jury, if you will, to be tried. Peter was sleeping, bound in two chains between two soldiers with guards outside the doors. Uh, and an angel stands before him, fills the, the prison with light, and it says that this angel uh, begins to, to strike or poke at Peter, you know, kind of waking Peter up. Hey, wake up. And when he does, he tells him to stand up, and immediately the chains in which he was bound by fell off. Now, he uses some interesting language here uh, as well in verse 8. He said, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said, put on your garment and follow me. Um, one thing I find interesting about this is you'll notice very similar language is, is mentioned um, concerning the Israelites uh, several times. In fact, when you 
uh, get to the sacrifice of the lambs, uh, which, the blood, which their blood is to be uh, put upon the doorposts before they exit Egypt on the, the last of the ten plagues, they're told these very same things. Get up, gird up your loins, you know, put on your, your jackets, put on your sandals and be ready to leave. And they're also told this um, in several other places, including things like in uh, Jericho as they're about to take over the city of Jericho. It's this idea of making preparation. Um, it is to be done without doubt. It is to be done in a way that knows that you are going to be leaving. It's not a, hey, follow me and may maybe things will work out. It's get ready. You're, you know, gather your things together. But let's go. Um, it's as if you've been on vacation, if you will, and you're getting ready to go home. You don't want to leave anything behind. Get everything together. You're leaving. It's time to go. And so the, uh, he, he mentions this to Peter. Now, the interesting part about uh, this instance with Peter and the angel is verse 9 tells us that Peter doesn't even really recognize that this is real, uh, which shows us two things. One, tells us a little bit about the vividness of the vision that maybe Peter had had previously concerning the, the sheet which was lowered down with the, the common or unclean animals. That maybe it was, it was so visible, so clear that it itself had seemed real. And so once he sees this other vision, it, it seems real. You know, is this, is this a vision? Excuse me, once he's experiencing this, he feels as if it's a vision. This must not be real. And it, it could seem a little bit unreal because what begins to happen? Well, they go past a set of first guards and they go past a set of second guards. And when they get to an iron gate which leads to the city, it opens to them by itself. And then he just walks out into the street, into the city, and the angel departs from him. So he's in chains between soldiers, is woken up, the chains fall off as he stands up. He's told to get ready, walks past one set of guards, walks past another, gets to an iron gate which opens by itself. He's led into the city, and then the angel's gone. You can see how this might be a little bit of an interesting scenario for Peter to be in. And notice what happens in verse 11. Peter had come to himself. He said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel, his messenger. And he delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. That word expectation might seem a little bit weird. The expectation of, of what was to happen to Peter. Uh, what they intended to do unto Peter is what he was delivered from. The persecution the, and potentially even uh, the, uh, the killing of the same way that had happened to James, the brother of John. Notice in verse 12. And when he had considered this, he, co he goes to the house of Mary, uh, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, um, where many were gathered together praying. So he goes to the place where those people who had been praying for his release. And Peter knocks at the door and there's a girl named Rhoda and she goes to answer and once she recognized that it was Peter, she doesn't answer the door. She goes to get everybody else. And what's the response of the rest of the group once Rhoda comes in and says, Hey, Peter's at the door. No, he's not. You know, <laughs> Peter's, in, Peter's in jail. Now, here's the interesting part about it. What are they in the house doing at that time? They're praying. For what? For Peter to be released. And then guess who comes knocking at the door? But Peter himself. And what's their response? That's not him. <laughs> it can't be him. That seems a little bit, uh, maybe sometimes like what our prayer life uh, turns into sometimes. They've got this desire that they're bringing forth before God, but they weren't expecting for their answer to literally be at their doorsteps, to literally be knocking upon their door. And even though they're praying for the release of Peter and praying that he would be removed from this persecution out of the hands of the Jews and out of the hands of Herod, he arrives at the house and what's their response? Can't be him. But what happens? They begin to notice, okay, that it is him. Only after they said, it is his angel. Okay, uh, you might ask, uh, what does it mean, it is his angel? There's two possibilities here. They could be thinking that maybe um, God is sending them a messenger on, uh, on Peter's behalf, or maybe that a messenger of Peter is being brought forth, but they did not see it as Peter uh, himself um, that use of the word angel could be interchanged with the use of the word uh, messenger. Uh, it is his messenger that is coming. But verse 16, he continues to knock. And they finally opened the door and they were astonished. 
They were, in, they were praying that Peter was going to be released, but apparently they didn't have the anticipation that he would actually be released. And so when he is, they're astonished at the fact, which most of us would be too. I mean, imagine if you were to hear the description that Peter was placed under the guard of, of four uh, uh, groups of, of soldiers, if you will, looking for the word, uh, let's see. Squads, four squads of soldiers, excuse me. I, I, could, I don't know why my brain wouldn't work uh, just now. Well, I do know why, uh, but it happens often. Uh, when you look at um, the description of what's, what's happening with Peter, okay, you'd probably be astonished too. How is this Peter, the night before he's set to go to trial, a man placed between two, sets of, uh, between two guards in chains in prison, would have to get through multiple uh, more sets of guards, and then a big old iron gate. How is this Peter? At our doorstep. How is he here? But notice the response of Peter once they open up the door. He motions to them with his hand to keep silent. Why? Well, because he's just walked out of jail. <laughs> he's just walked out of the prison. And he is at their door. And so he's motioning for them to keep silent. But notice what he does say. Notice what he doesn't, uh, or what he does tell them not to be silent concerning. He said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and goes into another place. So after being removed from the uh, prison, after being removed from the jail there, he goes to the house of Mary, finds those who are praying. They're astonished. He tells them to keep quiet, but only to go and tell uh, James and the rest of the brethren. So don't make too much noise and draw attention, but go and tell others about this. And uh, as soon as it was day, verse 18, I find verse 18 and 19 very interesting. Uh, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. They all wake up the next morning, and everybody's there but Peter, seemingly. And uh, there's, no, there's nothing uh, small about that. So notice what happens in verse 19. Herod uh, had searched for him and did not find him. He examined the guards and, the command, uh, and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. So this persecution uh, continues as Herod begins to uh, seek. Peter continues to run from Herod, and the guards are punished um, with uh, the removal of their own lives because of his escaping, uh, which would have resulted in, in the loss of his life uh, had he not escaped. So any questions or thoughts about verses 5 through 19? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very good point. I think that um, most of these leaders adored themselves and, and sought uh, for the praise and the worship of others. And so to defeat somebody is. is uh, hard working as Peter for the kingdom in their minds could have been seen as a defeat of God himself which would have exalted him uh, themselves I know they had a rule back then if a prisoner escaped whoever's guarding him would pay the price yes, sir. but I think, I think what a silly rule that was <laughs> you know because people are going to escape yes sir yeah if you're going to kill their soldiers they're going to have to replace the guards but um, and I think a lot of that would have to do with maybe with motivation. You know, if you're a guard and you're you're guarding a man on death row, you're probably going to be a little bit more diligent um, <laughs> uh, because you're you're thinking, you know, if this guy gets out, um, it's uh, it's the gallows for me. Uh, notice, notice verse 20 uh, with me. We'll go through verse 24 real quick. Uh, now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. But they came uh, to him with one accord, having made Blastus the king's personal aid, their friend. They asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and, and gave an oration unto them. And the people uh, kept shouting, 
the voice of God and not of man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eating uh, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. I want you to notice something about um, Herod's pretty abrupt and violent uh, death. Herod was filled, as was mentioned, with a lot of pride. He cared a lot about himself. He cared a lot about what others thought of him, uh, seemingly based on uh, his relationship or what we can see from his relationship with the Jews. But on top of that, uh, he did not give praise where praise was due or did not give adoration to whom adoration was to be given. And the result of his pride was humility. Not just was he uh, struck dead, uh, but it says that he was eaten by worms um, and died. But notice that although Herod himself was killed and his power, of course, was relinquished from him, Notice whose power continued to show in verse 24. The word of God grew and multiplied. While Herod was put into the ground, God himself and his message continued to be multiplied and grew much more. That section is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, it's a little bit strange because you think, okay, well, you know, it's a... A miraculous act, a very specific intentional act from God upon Herod through the use of his messenger or this, this death angel, if you will. Uh, but I think that it was for the purpose of what we see in verse 24. That after that removal of Herod, the word of God continued to grow and, um, and multiplied. Um, he, he punished the wicked and um, he continued to bless those who followed after him. Any thoughts? All right, let's get into verse 25 through chapter 13, verse 3. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Uh, now in the church um, that was at Antioch, there was a certain prophet and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, um, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, a Menaean who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul from the work, uh, for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. Once again, pretty self-explanatory. group of individuals together going to continue the message of teaching. God has called out specifically uh, for Barnabas and Saul um, uh, to go and do work together. And before they leave, they fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them before they sent them out. Two important things that we could note here. Uh, one, notice the, the pairing of the two. What would be important about pairing Saul and Barnabas together? Remember the context of the past couple of chapters. Separation between Jews and Gentiles. Maybe even the, the understanding of the persecution that Saul brought upon the church. And the wonderful things that Barnabas did. What would be important about Saul and Barnabas being coupled together as they went out to teach? Kind of recommend Saul, Exactly. Uh, you'll notice that as uh, Barnabas is going to be required at times to do exactly what he had already done and helped kind of pave the way. Because you have to remember, um, as Saul, um, especially he's still, got the, he's still going by, at least from what we can see, this uh, Jewish name, Saul. Um, Saul did some pretty evil, wicked, horrible things towards the church. And Barnabas helped, especially in those early days, to kind of help to bridge that gap between Saul and um, and the evil things that he did versus this new creation within himself, this, um, this resurrected one, this changed individual, this follower of Jesus. He helped to, to kind of usher him into the church by vouching for him almost, uh, saying that, you know, this man has changed, this man is different. So it would be important that they would be coupled together for the purpose of being able to continue the work. If Saul himself were to walk into 
a CD and begin to teach this message concerning Jesus, they, like many others, would probably continue to have that same thought that those um, who had first heard his teaching had. Is this not the same one who sought to kill Christians? It's not, is this not the same one who sought to kill people for teaching the very same thing that he is teaching? Hence, maybe the need for Barnabas and his accompaniment. As well as maybe to encourage um, uh, Saul, because you have to remember, Saul's going to be facing those tough times. Saul's going to be facing groups of people who might not be as um, excited about his arrival because of his previous actions. And what do we know Bar Barnabas is being? The encourager and uplifter. So maybe it was a good coupling for him not to just help to bridge that gap, but also to encourage Saul to continue in his teaching. But you notice also in verse 3 that before they sent him out, uh, they sent them out, they fasted, they prayed, and they laid hands upon them. They were doing everything that they could, everything within their power, to, to meditate upon them and to help them to focus before sending them on their journey. Um, they, they had a, a very close seemingly close relationship um, with the church there. And the church had great concern uh, for Saul and Barnabas. And so they did everything they could, even going so far as to couple, uh, coupling their prayers uh, with fasting. Any thoughts on that section? <laughs> yes, sir, he did, yeah. Absolutely. Um, he, helped, he helped to... to Break down that maybe those barriers that would have been present that that um, help them to be more understanding or maybe more inclined to listen to him. I mean, you have to think if somebody was persecuting uh, for years, persecuting the, the the church here at East Hill, and then suddenly he comes in the building and wants to begin to teach the message that he had been persecuting, you'd be a little bit hesitant of that ourselves, and and begin to think, you know, what's he really trying to do here? Is he trying to lure us in? Is he trying to trap us? They certainly are. Persecuted more common every day. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, sir. You'll notice some of the biggest warnings that are given to elders before the separation of the apostles from the elderships are to watch out for, for wolves both from the outside and from within uh, to, to keep the church to be steady in their understanding of Scripture. Yes, sir. All right, let's look at verse 4. We're moving quicker than I thought we would. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from, uh, from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they preached in uh, at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island of Papho, uh, to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose surname was Bar Jesus, who was with the uh, proconsul uh, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But uh, uh, Elamus, the sorcerer, uh, for so his name was translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O fool of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you will not cease uh, perverting the straight ways of the Lord. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him. And he went out around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And the proconsul believed, and when he saw what, he, what had been done, uh, being astonished at the teachings of the Lord. Um, you know, <laughs> Paul, Paul's got some, some harsh words there <laughs> against this false prophet. And, and rightfully so, seemingly, because if you'll notice that as they go to continue this teaching, it, it, it's, it's mentioned even before we see the mention of the proconsul himself 
we see the mention of this false prophet or this false teacher whose surname or his last name, we might say, is Bar-Jesus. Um, and we see in verse 8, it's Elimus or Elimus. Um, you see this power that this individual has. He is with this uh, proconsul, uh, Sergius Paulus, who is seemingly an intelligent man, as is, is, as is described in verse 7, but one who diligently or, or seeks to hear after the word of God. So this proconsul, a man seeking to hear after the word of God, has this influence of, of uh, this man, Bar-Jesus, uh, Elimus Bar-Jesus, who's a false teacher, is influenced by this man even though he wants to hear the faith, but this uh, Elimus is seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. He doesn't want him to be a follower of the way. Why is it that he might not want him to be a follower of the way? Well, because of probably the hold that this individual has upon him, this power that he has upon him. Um, and you'll notice in verse 9, Saul, being filled with the Holy Spirit, looks at him intently or looks intently at him. Seemingly from what we can see from this use of the phrase, being filled with the Holy Spirit, he's, he's speaking on behalf of God. He's speaking as a messenger of God. This isn't seemingly Paul's own emotions or feelings. This is a message seemingly directly from God. And he says, A man full of all deceit, all fraud, the son of the devil, enemy of all righteousness, who does not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord. That's very bold claims to be placed against him, but it, it's exactly what's happening. I mean, it's exactly, it's an apt description of this Elimus, one who is seeking to uh, remove or seeking to uh, not allow for this teaching of Jesus to be brought forth. And so the result of which, or the um, punishment for this, verse 11, is that Saul places his hand, uh, or says the Lord is upon you, and makes him to be blind, and immediately he is blinded, and he goes out seeking someone to lead him by the hand. I want you to notice something as well. This individual is described as a uh, false teacher, as one who is seeking to uh, lead others astray. But he's also described as a sorcerer. We make mention of maybe the actions towards Herod as being something that goes against the pride of Herod. This seemingly is an action directed at Elimus to go against the pride of Elimus. Removing the sight of Elimus that shows that God has a power over this individual rather than this individual having power over God. He, he seeks to um, stop this message from being taught and the result of which is that he himself is blinded. Now there's a little bit of irony, if you will, uh, in this um, because as one who is seeking for the teachings of Jesus not to be taught, he is one who is seeking for the light not to be shined upon this proconsul, for this proconsul not to be able to see the, the light that is shined uh, from above and the result of which is that he himself is physically blinded while attempting to spiritually blind um, this individual uh, of the pro-counselor, this pro-counselor. Um, and notice in verse 12, the result of this is uh, that he was astonished. Uh, when he had saw what was done, he was astonished at the teachings of the Lord, not just of the action, but also at the words of the Lord. So this individual tried to, to stop uh, Sergius Paulus from hearing the message of Jesus, the result of which is that he was blinded, uh, showing that he does not in fact have power over the teachings of Jesus, um, but that God has power over him. And the result, the ultimate result is the astonishment of Sergius Paulus uh, at the teachings of Jesus. Any thoughts on that section? Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Still working. Yeah. Now just through Saul. To my recollection, yes, sir, it would be his first recorded miracle. I can't think of a different one. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir, it would be. <laughs> Any 
Any more comments? Any more thoughts? I'm going to do something weird, all right? I'm going to end early today because this next section is uh, about 27-ish verses long. (laughs) We can't get through that in three minutes. Uh, So I'm going to call it early today, and we will pick up not next week. Brother Irby will be here next week. Um, But I will pick up uh, the next opportunity that we have to meet together um, in uh, Acts chapter 13 and verse 13. Thank you for your time.